Green. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome our friend Mr. Thomas Swick and his new book, The Joys of Travel and Stories That Illuminate Them. Mr. Swick is the author of the travel memoir, Unquiet Days at Home in Poland, and a collection of travel stories, A Way to See the World from Texas to Transylvania with a Maverick Traveler. For nearly two decades, Tom was the travel editor of the South Florida Sun Sentinel. He has traveled to more than 60 countries, chronicling his experiences in work that has appeared in the American Scholar, North American Review, Smithsonian, National Geographic Traveler, Afar, New York Times Book Review, and six editions of the Best American Travel Writing. In this book, Tom reflects on what he has identified as the seven joys of travel, anticipation, movement, break from routine, novelty, discovery, emotional connection, and heightened appreciation of home. Coupled with the personal essays are seven true stories that illustrate these joys. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Tom Swick. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Can everybody hear okay? Good. Um, thanks so much for coming. I, Sorry to dra drag you in on such a beautiful evening. Um, and I, I hear I'm actually making the singer shut up too, but um, it's only for an hour, I think. Um, it was exactly 25 years ago this year that I gave my first book reading. And it was at Books and Books. And it was down the street. None of you were there. <laughs> um, there weren't many people there at all, actually, which was good because I, I was terrified. I was a first-time author, hadn't done much public speaking, and um, it, was a, it was a rough evening. And um, because I was so nervous, I read. I just read. It was easy because the words were already there on the page. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk most of, the, most of the evening. I'm going to read just a little bit at the end because I'm worried if somebody came to a reading and didn't have a reading, they'd go away disappointed. Um, but I'm going to talk about the book. As some of you know, because I have uh, some friends planted in the audience, I've been a travel writer for quite a long time. And whenever I tell anybody what I do for a living, the response is almost always enthusiastic. Um, there's something about travel, especially making a living traveling, that just makes people envious. And I started wondering what it is. Why are people so attracted to travel? And I think, it's th I think the sites get all the publicity, which is kind of understandable. I think I th of all human activities, travel is perhaps the one most associated with the visual. You know, passport photos, window seats, open roof buses, glass bottom boats, art museums, postcards, vacation videos thousand places to see before you die. National Geographic photographer. National Geographic writer, not so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, the visual is, is very big in travel. But I think, and, and you know, a, a, a tr tourist traveling without a, a camera is, is as unthinkable as a teenager drinking non-alcoholic beer. Uh, what would be the point? And where would be the proof? But I think Sites are just one small part of what we like about travel. And I think I've, I've narrowed them down to seven specific gifts that travel gives us. And they're all things that can't be photographed. And the first is anticipation. You know, we feel it as soon as we plan the trip. You know, I think we all know that feeling when you click on the purchase button and you buy those tickets. And you now have a a place to look forward to. I find if I'm feeling kind of low and life has no interest anymore, it's because I have no trip coming up. <laughs> really, as soon as I plan a trip, things start to look better for me. Um, when I was a kid, the only time I had trouble sleeping was before a trip. It could be a simple thing like a class outing to the Hackettstown fish hatchery or a family vacation to the Jersey Shore. I tossed and turned, and, and, and in the now when I look back at it, I see it was kind of good preparation for jet lag. When I became a travel writer, that period of anticipation 
uh, became much more active. I really started to prepare for trips. I think the better prepared you are for each trip, the more interesting the trip is going to be. And because I'm a travel writer, I'm writing about a place, I do a lot of reading about the place I'm going. And I think we all do a certain amount of reading. We all buy guidebooks and travel books. I also read novels that are set in the place I'm going. They give you a lot of atmosphere, they give you insight, and they give you something to talk about when you get there. I also read newspapers if I'm traveling to a city in the U.S. And it's not as good to, I, I try to get the real paper. It's hard, because online you don't get the advertisements. Advertisements tell you a lot about a place. When we first moved to South Florida, I remember I picked up New Times. And I saw on the back all these ads for tanning salons and breast enlargement <laughs> and liposuction. And that told me something about South Florida. <laughs> there, was, there was this interest here in, in appearance that, uh, didn't quite exist up in Philadelphia, where I moved <laughs> from. Well, I do all that. I also listen to music from the place I'm going. I, I, um, I'll watch films from the country I'm going to. I'll study the language. I, you, know, y you all know that you know, just learning a few helpful phrases makes the trip a little smoother you know, in daily interactions. The more you, you study the language, the more it reveals about the culture. And um, as the trip gets closer, as the date of departure gets closer, my excitement is tinged by a bit of anxiety. You know, I st it's the reality starts to set in, and I'm going to leave the security of my home and go out into the world. And there's a word in this in German, Reisefieber. Reise means journey, Fieber means fever. And it, German has a lot of words that have to do with travel. There's one we use in English. Anybody know? Wanderlust. Wanderlust is a German word. Everybody's talking about the gap year now, right? Because Malia Obama is going to take a gap year before she goes to Harvard. Centuries before the Brits had a gap year, the Germans had a Wanderjahr. Same thing. The Germans even have a word for the opposite of homesickness, Fernweh. It's that feeling when you're home of wanting to be elsewhere. And this is a perfect example how, of how language, the study of a language tells you about the culture because I think the Germans are the world's best travelers. And I think you might have noticed when you travel, you, you run into Germans. There's a, there's a debate in the, in the travel community. Uh, you know, what distinguishes a traveler from a tourist? Right? And Paul Theroux has, has said that a traveler doesn't know where he's going, a tourist doesn't know where he's been, <laughs> which is good. It's a good one. I think a traveler is also somebody who goes somewhere and doesn't find the German. <laughs> I was, a few years ago, I was in the Cook Islands uh, doing a magazine story. And one day I was on this tiny island of Aitutaki. And I ran into a German family, of course, father, mother, and two grown daughters who were taking their family vacation in Aitutaki. You know, my family took their vacations at the Jersey Shore. But <laughs> and I asked him one day at lunch, I asked the father one day, why are the Germans such great travelers? And he attributed it to the writer, uh, Goethe, who in the 1780s wrote a book called Italian Journey. It was about him traveling through Italy and Sicily. And he said that book opened Germans' eyes to the the value of, of seeing what lies beyond their borders. I thought that was interesting. It's a shame that Mark Twain's The Innocents Abroad didn't have the same uh, effect on Americans. The second joy of travel, I think, is movement. And this is one I think we tend to overlook. These days, nobody goes off on a trip thinking about the, the pleasure of movement. They think about the ordeal of flying somewhere, you know. Travel's become such, especially by air, has become a hassle, uh, and it's uncomfortable. But if you've ever doubted the joy that movement can give you, notice your feeling, your reaction, the next time you're sitting on your plane, and it's sitting at the gate, and it's 15 minutes past departure time, mm -hmm. and you're looking at your watch, and you're worrying about your connection in Atlanta, 
And all of a sudden, the plane nudges backwards and starts to move. That's as uplifting as, as takeoff and a lot less stressful. The other great thing about a plane, it's the only time when you're sitting there, it's the only time in your life that you're kind of free from, unless you're traveling with children, it's the only time you're free from all responsibility. You can watch a movie, you can listen to music, you can read a book. You, you, you have no responsibility. You can do that at home much more comfortably, but at home you have this nagging voice saying you should probably go to the gym. <laughs> and on the plane you can't, you're stuck there. So that, that entrapment in a way is kind of liberating. Ship travel is probably the most sensual of all the forms of travel. You know, you not only see and feel and hear, but you, in the salt air, you can taste and you can smell your progress ac across the globe. But you have to get outside. That's the problem with the cruise ships. There's so much going on on the big cruise ships that many people don't even go out. I was on a cruise. I used to take a cruise every year for the newspaper. And I was once, they were always in the Caribbean. And I was once on the promenade da deck at, at dusk, and I was watching the sunset. It was a beautiful sunset in the Caribbean. And I was the only one there. And I walked down to my cabin to get changed for dinner. And I walked past the dining room, and there were about six couples standing, waiting to have their picture taken in front of a painted backdrop of a sunset. <laughs> <coughs> All modes of transportation are forms of escape. You know, the, the plane takes you away from Earth and surrounds you with clouds. The ship takes you away from land, surrounds you with water. Trains remove you from the world while taking you right through it. You know, they go through the middle of towns and you see kids playing in schoolyards and dogs barking at mail trucks and people walking down Main Street. Life, as you know it, is going on just there, outside, right on the other side of the window. It's a wonderful feeling. I think that you know, lovers are tr of trains are escapists who still want to see what it is that they're escaping. Um, and even Amtrak, which is not the best of, of the world's train services, still gives you that pleasure of, of train travel. Cars are a little different because we're not we're still in control. We're not, we're not totally freed. Uh, we're not passengers. We're, we're driving. But it's still very um, liberating, that, that ability to just go. You know, you can travel for thousands of miles without changing money, changing languages, needing a... You can put as, much, as many liquids as you want in your toiletries <laughs> bag. Nobody cares. It's a, it's a, and, you know... Although car travel has really, um, it's given our literature, uh, American literature, some, some wonderful books. John Steinbeck's <laughs> Travels with Charlie. Jack Kerouac's On the Road. William Least Heat Moon wrote a book called Blue Highways. Even Henry Miller wrote a book about driving or actually being driven from New York to California called The Air Conditioned Nightmare. He'd just come back from years of living in France, and, and he hated everything about America, except Big Sur, which is where he ended up living. I think even Nabokov's Lolita is, in, in small part, a, a book about a road trip. And it took, a, it took an aristocratic European to really know this and, and lovingly describe all that wonderful kitsch of, of roadside America. And then there's the uh, form of walking as, as transportation. And a lot of people have found the joy of walking, um, walking this pilgrimage in, uh, to Santiago in the north of Spain. It's become a very popular thing to do. I did a pilgrimage in Poland in 1982 from Warsaw, where I'd been living for two and a half years, to Czestochowa, and it was a nine-day walk. And in 1992, Poland was still under martial law, the leaders of the Solidarity Movement were in prison. Uh, public gatherings were still outlawed, but nobody was going to stop this, this annual pilgrimage because it was a religious event. But that year, it also had a very strong political cast. And walking on that pilgrimage with thousands of Poles, you know, through the fields, um, into little villages, I, I felt more in touch with Poland than I had in, in the two and a half years I'd lived in the capital. It was a wonderful feeling. And Years later, I read a, a book called The Lost Art of Walking by Jeff Nicholson. 
And he says in that book that walking through a place, like writing about a place, is a way to possess it. And it was, I, I, I knew exactly what he meant. You know, when you walk, you're not only observing the scenery, you're part of it. You know, like the trees, you're exposed to the sun and the wind and the rain and the mud, which is all over your boots, you know, which is where that feeling of possession begins. The third pleasure of travel is a break from routine. And in this country, we think of vacation, which associ we associate with travel, kind of as a, a, a break from work. And there are people who don't even avail themselves of that. You know, there are people who don't like to travel. There are the narcissists who think that if they're away from the office, everything's going to fall apart. There are the control freaks who really don't like the unpredictable nature of travel. There are the know-it-alls who don't do well in unfamiliar places, you know, if you, especially foreign places. You, you can't feel superior when you can't even ask for a glass of water. <laughs> the great English poet, Philip Larkin once said, I would love to see China if I could come back the same day. <laughs> and he was a great English poet, but not a great English traveler. And there have been many, even uh, in, in the field of literature. Uh, in the old days, and for many years, it was kind of routine for writers to write travel books. Um, Charles Dickens, Anthony Trollope. D.H. Lawrence, Rebecca West, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Graham Greene, Evelyn Wall. They all wrote travel books in between novels. And, and travel was good for them because it got them out of the house. It got them out of their heads. And, and it gave them subjects for, for novels in many cases. Graham Greene went to Mexico in the 1930s to investigate the, the government ban on religion. And he came back with a great novel, The Power and the Glory, but he also came back with a great travel book, The Lawless Roads, which not that many people are, are familiar with. But we all benefit, I think, from a break from routine. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you travel, you can kind of, you kind of have a, kind of a make-believe life overhaul. You know, you try on a foreign city, a second language, a, a new persona, and, and see how they feel. And, and the longer you stay, the the, the more substantial that makeover becomes. A year after I got out of college, I, um, I moved to France for a year because I thought if I was serious about this travel writing b thing, I, I should speak another language. And I studied for seven months in Aix-en-Provence in an institute for foreign students. And when the year was over, I went to Alsace, which is in the northeast of France, about as far as you can get, at least culturally, from Provence as possible. And I found a job on a farm. And all of a sudden, the student, who I, which I had been for almost my entire life, became a farmhand. And everything changed. My clothes changed. My, my patterns changed. My, my chores changed. I was walking the cows out to pasture and, and baling hay and doing all these things. And it was, it was invigorating, not just the work, but the, the change, the new identity. I did an interview last week with um, Joseph Cooper on, and Bonnie Berman on topical currents. And Joseph Cooper was going over my background, and at one point he looked at me and said, well, you don't look like a farm guy. <laughs> and, but that was the point. You know, to do something different, to, to, to take on a new identity. And my French got pretty good that summer because I'd had that really good foundation in school. And then I was speaking it day in, day, day in and day, day out. And, and that kind of, when I speak French now, I kind of become a slightly different person. I have a friend in California who speaks Japanese. He lived in Japan, married a Japanese woman. And he says that he, when he speaks Japanese, he becomes Japanese to such an extent that he'll bow to the person he's talking to on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so the other, the fourth joy of travel is novelty. And I think this is the glamour joy. Um, but there are still people who, de I call them novelty deniers, and you've probably met them. Those people who've traveled a lot and they complain that they don't like to travel anymore because 
every place now looks the same. You've heard that, right? And that is so, that is so ridiculous. You know, it's, it's, it's the biggest lie in travel next to, for you, my friend, a special deal. <laughs> we have, we, you see the fallacy of it right here in South Florida. All the, all the coastal cities and towns are built according to the exact same blueprint. There's an east-west main street, a bridge, and a barrier island. They all share the same ocean. They all share the same vegetation. But Miami is completely different from Fort Lauderdale. Nobody would ever confuse Hollywood with Delray Beach. These differences exist. And I think when we travel, we have to kind of look at the, the, the big picture and then also look at the nuances. I think in the old days, the most important quality in the traveler was a sense of adventure. You know, you, ha you had to be adventurous to set out in the old days. I think today the most important quality in the traveler is a sense of wonder. You know, the world's been a little overexposed. We've seen so many pictures and we've read so much. And, and we've become a little inundated. But I think for the person who travels wide-eyed in an age of information overload, there's still revelations to be had. Um, and they may not be more numerous than they used to be, but I think they're more potent because they're unexpected. I'm not a big sightseer. And when I go to sites, it's often the things I see, the incidental things I see that I remember. When I was in high school, my, um, my parents made me take Latin. And um, one day my junior year, the Latin teacher came in and said that the... Uh, the Latin clubs of New Jersey were sponsoring an Easter trip to Rome, Naples, and Sorrento. And I thought, this is my chance to get back at my parents for making me take <laughs> Latin. And I went home, and after dinner, I told them about the trip and how much I'd love to go. And to their eternal credit, they said yes. So I went to, I went to Italy as a junior in high school. And we arrived in Naples and went to Pompeii. And uh, I remember walking the streets of Pompeii, and we passed a group of European schoolgirls. We couldn't tell what country they were from. They weren't speaking Latin. Um, <laughs> but they all, had, they all had their pants legs rolled, and they were exhibiting legs as hairy as my father's. <laughs> and I'd never seen a woman with hairy legs before. I didn't know a woman would have hairy legs. I had a very sheltered, sisterless childhood. And that's what, I, th that's what I remember from Pompeii, partly because, <laughs> partly because they, did not show us, they did not show us the erotic murals. I, I would definitely have remembered those. But when I came back from that trip and people asked, you know, how was Italy? I, I told them about the splendors of the Colosseum and the Sistine Chapel, but all the time I was thinking about those hairy legged schoolgirls. So it's the things we see sometimes on the way to the sites. And it's not just the sites, as you know, when you travel. It's, it's, it's everything, the smells, the sounds. Uh, I love music. And I, when I travel, I always have my ear out for, for singers. I, I kind of collect uh, new singers when I travel. And I was in Turkey a number of years ago. And I was staying in a little town called Selçuk, because it's right near Ephesus. And the owner of the guest house offered to give me a ride that the next morning to Ephesus. And uh, on the way, he was playing this wonderful music. And I said, who's that, who's that singer? And he said, oh, that's Cezanne Aksu. And I remember the name because when I went to Izmir, I bought a CD. And I, I still have it. And I listen to it, not just because I like the music, but when I hear that music now, Turkey comes flooding back. You know, music is a great aid memoir. It brings back memories of places. Um, and then, you know, there are, of course, the tastes, when we, the new tastes when we travel. Uh, eating is a big part of travel. If you watch the Travel Channel, you know it's the only part of travel. <laughs> um, but, but it is. It's a big part of travel. And, and one disadvantage we have is that we often now, because we have so much ethnic food in America, we sometimes eat the food before we visit the country. You know, it's hard to imagine an American going to Mexico today and eating his first taco. Uh, but I did have my first focaccia in Italy, which is hard to imagine 
considering how much focaccia exists in this country in all kinds of forms. But, you know, I, it was, I still remember it was such a revelation. You know, it didn't look that appetizing, but I bit into it and it was salty and moist from olive oil and it had the herbs and it was just delicious. And, and now whenever I eat focaccia, that remind, it reminds me of that cafe in Genoa where I had my first focaccia. My mother grew up in near Hershey, Pennsylvania. And she and my father came to visit me when I was studying in Aix-en-Provence. And one day after lunch, I bought a Toblerone bar, which now you can buy at Publix, right? But in the 70s, was not that, that common. And I'll never forget the expression on my mother's face when she took that first bite of that triangle of chocolate-covered nougat. And she, her face just lit up, like, you mean chocolate can taste like this? I think, you know, I, I'm convinced that the craft beer movement, the, the artisanal bakeries, all the specialty chocolates that we have now in this country, all that was kind of instigated by Americans who traveled abroad and, and t you know, saw that not every beer has to take like Budweiser. You know, there, <laughs> there are other things out there. And um, we, we get all this from travel, the, the novelties. Discovery is the fifth joy of travel. And discovery is something that we, we learn things sometimes just by observing. You know, when we arrive, I always tell travel writing students, when you arrive in a new place, first thing you do, just leave your bags in the hotel and just walk, just wander and, and take everything in. Everything looks fresh and new. It's almost like high definition in those first few hours. After a few days, it starts to look familiar. But, you know, just, a couple hours walking in a foreign city, you learn more than anything you've read in preparation for the trip. I went to Poland for the first time in 1978. Poland was part of the Soviet bloc, and all the big stores were state-owned. And I was fascinated by the mannequins. I'd never seen mannequins that looked so ridiculous. They, they had hair that looked like straw, and they wore these boxy brown outfits. And then I'd look at the women walking on the street, especially the young woman and women, and they were very stylish. You know, the way they tied a scarf or wore a hat and carried their, their leather bags on their hips. And I, I remember the first article I wrote, I said, um, Warsaw's the only city I've ever seen where the women are more fashionable than the mannequins. But there was a reason for that. In, in uh, those days, Poles could travel much more easily than any other Eastern Europeans. So students for the summer would leave Poland, they'd go to Western Europe, and they'd work, they'd make money, they'd buy clothes, they'd come back and, especially the women, beautify the streets of, of Warsaw. Um, so there was a, an instance of, of just learning something just through observation. But you really, really learn about a place when you talk to the people. And um, this is something I urge uh, all, obviously, travel st uh, writing students do, but, but even regular, regular tourists. Um, you travel and um <coughs> me. Travel, tourists kind of travel in their own world. Uh, it's a world of hotels and restaurants and museums and souvenir shops. And it doesn't often inter intersect with the world of the locals, which, which is a world of apartments and offices and classrooms and playgrounds and parks and houses of worship. And I always urge tourists to kind of make that shift, to kind of go places where they'll meet locals. In Europe, if you still buy postcards, which I do, you'll sometimes be asked in the store if you want stamps with the postcards. That'll save you a trip to the post office. And I always tell people, no, don't buy the stamps. Go to the post office, because it may be the one time in your trip that you experience the life of a local. And who knows, you may get uh, talking to the people you're standing in line with. Um, so, you know, learning about a place through meeting the people. Um, it's, it's difficult sometimes uh, to, to do that, to, to get out of your, your shell and, and meet people. You kind of have to go out, get over any possible shyness you might have or anything. But I think it, it pays. Uh, and then of, this, of all the joys, this joy of discovery is the one that has an importance that goes beyond the personal. You know, we live in a democracy. So the more we know about the world, the more qualified we are to pick qualified leaders uh, to lead us in the world. 
Does anybody have any idea how many Americans have passports? Exactly. Uh, in fact, in the 90s, it was 14, 15 percent. Now it's about 35 percent, which is uh, artificially high because you, you need passports now to come back from Mexico and Canada. So a lot of people who go on cruises have passports. They're not what I would call world travelers. And when you tell foreigners this, especially, I think, Europeans, they're just they're astounded and a bit alarmed, you know, that a country that has so much influence in the world has so little experience with the world. Um, and it's, it's a shame, unfortunately, but it's, it's the way. I, but I think it's, it's changing because it, people are taking gap years now. Um, <laughs> the sixth joy is emotional connection. And this is the one that doesn't always happen. It's not a given. In fact, I, th I think it's very rare. Um, there are only a handful of places where I felt connected emotionally to them. And the first time I experienced this without living in a place, just going there as a regular traveler, was in Portugal. And I'd been in Spain. I'd been doing stories in Spain. But I'd, and I'd been to Spain before, and I'd never been to Portugal. And in Spain, I just went to the major cities, Madrid, Barcelona, Seville. And I got to Portugal, and at this point, I, th I knew something was missing. I'd never been on assignment before. This was actually my first assignment as the travel editor at the Sun Sentinel. And I, I knew I wasn't doing what I should be doing. I was just going to the sites and eating a lot of meals by myself. And I, I, I got to Portugal, and I was desperate. And I went to this town of Coimbra, which is the univer a big university town in, in Portugal. It's known as the Oxford of Portugal. And I just went to the English department. And I said, I'm going to talk to the first person I see who speaks English. And it was a Dutch woman um, <laughs> who was very nice. And she t we went to a cafe. And she was teaching Dutch for the year in, in Portugal. And she told me about her experiences. But she had a friend back in Lisbon, a poet, Casimiro de Brito. And she said, when I get back to Lisbon, I should call him up. And I did. And Casimiro invited me to dinner with him and his wife, in this wonderful restaurant, little place I never would have found because they had no sign out outside. And after dinner, we took a walk, and we went to a, we ended up at a dive. Um, it was just full of men, and tough-looking men. They looked like longshoremen, uh, sitting at long wooden tables. Except for one who sat on, it was a very emaciated man, sat on a stool with a guitar, and sat under a single light bulb, bare light bulb. It was kind of like a booth cartoon from the New Yorker or something. And Every once in a while, one of the men would stand up and sing this beautiful, melancholic song. And it was Fado, you know, it was this, this music of Portugal that's of love and loss and yearning. And days before, I'd passed restaurants that offered folkloric evenings of dinner and Fado. And I hadn't gone to any of them because I suspected they might not be that authentic. There's an American writer, Nelson Algren, who said once, never eat at a place called Mom's. Never play poker with a man named Doc. <laughs> and never sleep with a woman who has more problems than you do. <laughs> and I would add to that, never go to a place that advertises folkloric evenings. <laughs> but, but that night was not a folkloric evening. It was the real thing. And, and I really, as, you know, and Kajimiro would, would translate the songs uh, when they finished singing. And, and one, I remember the, still remember the line of one, it smells of Lisbon, it smells of flowers and the sea. And that night, I kind of, I, I, I think I discovered the secret of travel writing, which, which is to approximate as best you can in the short time allotted you the life of a local, you know, to participate in the life of the place. And I think the same thing applies to meaningful travel. You know, if you can have an experience and, and, and really relate to the place. And that, that brings me to Italy. I love Italy. I've been to Italy six times since that Latin Club's trip. And every time I've had wonderful experiences. I've met really good people. Some of them have become friends. I never get the feeling that Italy loves me back. <laughs> Italy's the most popular girl in school. You know, everybody's vying for her attentions. And I've never felt the bond with Italy that I feel with Vietnam and Turkey and even Mexico and Brazil. 
It just it hasn't happened. The last pleasure of travel, and on, I'll, I'll finish quickly here, uh, is heightened appreciation of home. And you know, we all experience this when we travel. We see things that we have here that we don't have in other places. One thing I always, not always, but usually notice in con other countries is the rich variety that we have in the United States. Um, you go to Prague, and it, it's beautiful. And you're walking down those cobblestone streets, and it, it, you're just enchanted. Until about the third day, and you realize that those streets don't lead to any Hispanic neighborhood, no Italian market. There's no Chinatown. <laughs> it's just Czechs. <laughs> you and Czechs and a lot of other tourists, you know. <laughs> the same thing, I mean, which is great, you know, for your trip because that's what you want. You want to experience Czech culture and Czech cuisine and maybe Czech women. But you want to experience that. Um, but you realize, you know, you have a rich, rich life here in America. Um, and you go to, to Tokyo, and, and it's just, it's astounding, the, the visual stimulation, the intersections, the lights, and the, and the, and the screens. And the, it's like in a, you're like in a video game, and all the plastic food that looks so real. And then you look, and you notice everybody has straight black hair. Everybody, except, you know, somebody dyed their hair purple, maybe. But, you know, in the, in the strange land is a strange uniformity. And it's one of the ironies of travel for Americans, you know, that in search of the foreign, we realize how much of it we have here at home. And we also realize, I think, in more conservative, traditional societies, how most of us are okay with that, you know, how we do kind of get along. You know, in, in a country like Cuba, in Russia, again, we, we do appreciate our democracy, even though it does sometimes produce unlikely presidential candidates. <laughs> And, and then even little things, you know, really small things. Um, I went to India for three weeks and came home. My wife met me at Miami airport and we, I got in the car and we were driving up I-95 to Fort Lauderdale and I, I thought, people drive really well here. <laughs> and it was the, it was the first, yeah, I, I had to go to India to really appreciate South Florida drivers. <laughs> um, so th that is, in a, in a nutshell, that is the first half of the book. It's personal essays on these seven joys. And the second half of the book are seven stories that each one relates to one of the joys. And the la I'm going to read just the page from the last story, which is about, a, it's about the Midwest. Uh, a place I love to travel. And it's one of those places when you tell people you're going to the Midwest, they say, huh, why are you going to the Midwest? But it is, it is, it's a great place to travel. And this is a, a special kind of trip because it was a book tour I did in, in the Midwest. And if you read a lot um, of literary or, or bookish journals, you'll know that there's kind of a tradition of writers writing about how they hate their book tour. You know, they bash the book tour. And I took a different approach. Travel writers, regularly dismissed as trivialists, rarely indulge in the popular book tour wine. It's not just that we have bigger trips to fry, we have fewer bones to pick. We don't see what novelists find so objectionable about a diet of fine hotels, especially when the rooms all come reserved and generously paid for. We are puzzled by the memoirist complain about living out of a suitcase because to us it's infinitely preferable to living in the past. And needless to say, we don't quite grasp the horror of going out and meeting readers. Those sensitive souls who flaunt their lack of social skills are as pathetic as people who boast that they are bad at math. A signing in Dubuque is not a journey into the heart of darkness. The only possible trauma of a book tour is the potential encounter with apathy, the empty chairs of a ghostly chain at the short end of a mall in a town without pity. But for this, too, travel writers are much better prepared. We tend not to enter MFA programs, teach at universities, live in New York City, so we are in constant touch with the great unread. From our hours spent in airports, we know that most Americans, when presented with large chunks of free time and removed from demanding home entertainment systems, will find almost any excuse, a smartphone, a laptop, another bag of chips, not to pick up a book. 
traveling, we're continually reminded of the growing homelessness of the written word. So, unburdened by illusions and still out of the house, travel writers are the happiest authors on tour. Some may give the impression, often by their wardrobes, that they'd be much more content sharing gourds of gazelle blood with Maasai tribesmen, but don't believe them. A book tour provides us with a focus, not always a given in our all-over-the-map trade, and the focus, in another pleasing twist, is us. That story ends with a uh, reading in Dubuque. So, I'll... <laughs> thanks. I'll stop there and uh, open it up to questions. Uh, if anybody has anything they want to ask me. Yes? Do you take lots of photos when you travel? And if not, why not? Do I take lots of photos when I travel? Uh, not so much anymore, but I did when I was at the newspaper. Uh, they, they didn't send a photographer with me. It was, you know, it was just me, so I had to come back with stories and photos. And I actually got to like it, even though I never think of myself as a... As a photographer. I'm a writer with a camera. But I got to really enjoy taking photos and um, you know I would usually kind of, s I, I never take photos the first few days. I want to see everything with my own, the naked eye. Uh, and I want to get used to the place. I want to really see the place. But after a few days, um, toward the end of a day, you know, when the light's getting nice, I'll say, okay, now I'm gonna, gonna just focus on photography for an hour or two. I always have a camera with me, just in case I see something that's really, really interesting. But, um, but again, I'm a writer who, who, who travels with a camera. No other questions? Uh, yes? How do, you, how, do you, how do you meet more locals when the locals themselves are equally as lost as not lost, but I mean distracted as we are with modern technology. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's <laughs> a, how do you meet locals when they're distracted by modern technology? Yeah, and modern technology is a, really, is a real handicap now to, to travel uh, and meeting travelers. Well, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually, it's an advantage in some ways. You know, I was talking about how, how to get into apartments, you know, and meet the people. Well, now, you know, Airbnb, couch surfing, now it's easy. You used to have to depend on your charm. Now you can use, you can use technology. But, but um, yeah, some, I've been in places where I want to ask somebody for directions and they all, you know, they all got the earbuds in and, and you can't really um, engage them. It's, it, it makes it more difficult, definitely. Yeah. Yes? Can I just follow on that question and your suggestion? I've uh, tried not to follow get the deals from the big hotels because usually people go with their plan, they have their tours booked and nobody's interested in talking with anybody else. But uh, choosing a bed and breakfast or a youth hostel if you dare go to one, mm -hmm. you do get to meet people. I did find up some lodging at the house of a, of a Danish diplomat and I found out how light, light was so important for the, for the Scandinavian because they get so little of it. When I went into their living room, oh my, it was such a revelation, the, the way they had their house lit. Yeah. I also went to, um, to, to this youth hostels in, uh, in Brazil and got to meet students locally and got to do things with them. So it was interesting. Yeah, and, and you say that if you dare to go to a youth hostel, actually youth hostels now are, are open to everybody. Uh, it, and they're very, um, they become very um, pleasant places to stay most of the time. Uh, the gentleman here had a question. Do you visit schools and talk to English departments and students? In when I'm traveling or no, I here? Mean, now and when you're not. When I'm invited. <laughs> when you're invited. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a moment in your travels in which you experienced something that was truly unpleasant or perhaps even dangerous? Oh, no, I think you stumped me. I've, as somebody's asked me that once, uh, and I've never had a truly dangerous experience, maybe because I'm just a timid traveler and I haven't put myself in those situations. I'm an urban traveler. I don't do a lot in nature. Uh, nature writing is a, a kind of a, a, another form of travel writing, and I don't, I'm not qualified to do nature writing. So I spend a lot of time in cities. And I've never really felt threatened. I've never been mugged. Well, I was 
almost mugged in Lafayette, Louisiana once. Okay, that was it. Uh, that was it. Yes. A man asked me for money because he ran out of gas, he said, and I made the mistake of pulling out my wallet. <laughs> and he saw how much money I had, and I gave him five dollars, and I walked down the street, and two blocks later, he came running up to me. He had a sweater on, and he pointed his finger <laughs> at me and said, give me your wallet. And I didn't know it was his finger, but I suspected it was his finger. <laughs> and I said, I thought, I was like Jack Benny, you know, <laughs> your money or your life. I was thinking about it. Um, I just didn't believe he had a gun, and I just pulled myself away and, and ran across the street, and he didn't have a gun. So that was, the, that was probably the riskiest situation. <laughs> Yeah, Chauncey. First, let me say it's a good thing that you don't go out to the city where it's more dangerous. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I so the man, says the man who got lost in the Everglades a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I admire the way that you travel, and I acknowledge its superiority. Yeah. Don't, you think, don't you think you're a little hard on, on the tourists? And don't you think there's a tinge of anti-Americanism anti in the attitude that foreigners have toward Americans? Because America is a big country with only two contiguous other countries. Yeah. And there's a lot to see and do here. There is, Whereas yeah. in Europe, you know, you, you walk come yeah, across that sure. direction, you're in another country. You know, small countries close together, travelers, yeah, yeah, yeah. travelers much more part of their daily life. Yeah. But the first part of that, I, I don't think I'm, I'm hard on, on tourists, because I think we're all tourists now. I mean, I'm a tourist, you know. It's just that I'm a tourist who's traving, trying to have the local experience, you know, trying to have the experience of a, of a local. But I, no, I don't kid myself, you know, we're all, we're all tourists now. Um, and about the U.S., it, yeah, I mean, I have nothing, and I don't even, I don't even begrudge, and I said this on uh, Topical Currents last week, I don't begrudge people who just go on cruises. I mean, Americans work hard, and, and if you just get two weeks of vacation a year, and you just want to go on a cruise and eat a lot and s sit by the pool, that, I don't, I'm nothing against that. I don't think that's a problem. I just think it's a shame that because we are such a powerful country in the world that we don't know more about the world. That's, that's it. Yes? Yeah. Why did you feel uh, as like uh, in your home? Where d have I felt like I'm at home? Yes. What countries? Yes. Uh, I, I write about them in the book, and I mention them, I think, kind of obliquely in my talk. Uh, Poland, because I lived there for two and a half years, and I married a Polish woman who's here. Um, Alsace, because I had that wonderful summer working on the farm, and, and I still keep in touch with the family, and, and uh, I feel very much at home there. Vietnam was a country where people went out of their way to make me feel welcome. Turkey, um, Mexico, huh? Is it really? Ah, well, it's one of my favorite countries. I, I, I just, I rave all the time about Turkey because uh, it, it has a kind of, it gets this bad image. Uh, there was this horrible movie, Midnight Express, about an American who got caught and put in prison, and Americans think that's, that's Turkey. And, and, you know, if you get put in prison in any country, uh, it's, it's going to be a tough uh, time. But, um, no, I mean, everywhere I went in Turkey, there was this, I, I just felt people wanted to make me, you know, I think countries are divided in those that make me feel like a tourist and those that make me feel like a guest. And the ones I'm mentioning, also Mexico, Brazil, and Lithuania, are countries where I always felt like a guest. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the woman. Yeah. Oh. Um. Two things. Do you have? Did you develop a sort of a repertoire of uh, icebreakers and entrees to talking to people wherever you were, sort of that, uh, a way to strike up a conversation? And then also, just a point I wanted to make that there are tour operators, international tour operators, that specialize in having um, local people do little tours uh, for folks coming into different countries all over the world, and they're, they're just sort of uh, people who do tours, 
and it's a great way to have a local person give you right. a, a local tour right. and whatever your questions are and that sort of thing to get to know the area like a local work. Yeah, there are a lot of organizations yeah. like that. And, and then volunteerism is big now where you, you, know, you go to a place and you, you work with the, the people. I did one of those trips to Mexico uh, many years ago when I was at the newspaper uh, teaching English uh, for a couple weeks. Uh, but as far as a repertoire, I don't. I really, um, I just kind of see what the situation is. And, you know, the one thing helping me is the fact that, uh, I, as I said, I do a lot of preparation. And so I can, I can ask intelligent questions about the place. You know, I can throw out names of filmmakers and, and novelists that, that they'll recognize. And, and that pe makes people much more receptive to you and, and want to, uh, to want to engage you. commerce and you can go to their activities and, you know, you can, you can go to the chambers of commerce and right. things. I don't, yeah, as a travel sense. writer, mm -hmm. uh, I never go to the chamber of commerce, I don't go to the tourist boards, <laughs> I don't want to get the party line, you know, I want to <laughs> discover the place on my own. They're going to tell you the good stuff and show you what they want you to see, and I like just poking around on my own and, and uh, seeing the good and the bad, and, yeah. Visit all these countries, right? Are there any souvenirs? Are there any type of maybe coin collections or any personal hobbies that you might take along with you? Yeah, I mean, in addition to the music. Uh, oh, the, the question was, uh, do I have any um, hobbies or do I get any kind of theme souvenirs when I travel? Uh, music. I mean, I have a collection of CDs now that are just you know from all many of the countries I've been to. Um, I also collect Polish folk art. Uh, Polish folk art is very rich, and, and they have these wooden figures that are painted. That are, some are religious, some are secular, but I have a, a small collection of those. And I, wherever I go, I look for something similar. And I found them sometimes. I, I found one in Jamaica. I found the figure. I mean, Mexico, if you love folk art, is, is heaven. Uh, the folk art is so rich there. But they don't have anything quite like what I have from Poland, so I don't buy as much. But that, I would say music and folk art are the two things, yeah. Um, you're probably asked, what should I see when I come to America? And I'm wondering what might be some of the surprising places you suggest. Yeah, what they, when I uh, travel, when people ask me what they should see when they come to my country, um, I always tell them, you know, after they see the things that they know about New York and Washington and, and San Francisco and everything. I recommend usually two places, the Midwest, because I think the Midwest, you get a wonderful reception in the Midwest. Um, I didn't say this earlier, I just I, I forgot, but when before I go on a trip I tell everybody I meet where I'm going because I want to hear their reactions and if people say, huh, why are you going there? I get really excited, I think this could be good. And the Midwest is definitely one of those places, and, and, and the South, the American South, is a really interesting place. And there's a new travel, not new, it came out last year, but Paul Theroux uh, has written a travel book uh, about, it's called Deep South, about his travels around the South, and it's one of his best books ever. And um, so those are, those are two places I definitely tell people to, to see. Yes? That surprise at you, like you prepare yourself and then you what you, you, you enter there and surprise what oh, it's different what they imagine. Yeah, did any place surprise me? I'm trying to think. Um, every place surprises you to a certain degree. Um, you know, Havana, I went to Cuba in 2001 and I, I was surprised by Havana because I come here a lot, you know, books and books, and they always have these f coffee table books about old Havana and I look through them and I thought, you know, sometimes you, you go, you've seen pictures of a place and you go there and you've seen it all. I mean, you've seen all the pictures of it, you know. I, went to a, I once went to a town in Spain because I saw this beautiful, a picture of this beautiful street in this town. I thought the whole town would be like that. It was just one street. <laughs> and and I, I kind of figured that with Havana because I just thought we see so many photos here uh, of the city. And when I got there, I was just amazed at how rich architecturally the city is. Uh, there was much more than I had seen pictures of. You know, there's the old town, there's the centro, there's Vedado, which used to be a suburb, 
and has all this, you know, it, you go from, from cl Spanish colonial architecture all the way up to mid-century modern and everything in between. And that, that really surprised me. That was a place that surprised me. Yes, all the way back. Have not been so far that you Africa. Okay. Africa. I don't know Africa at all. I've been to Algeria and Egypt. That's it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of places. I haven't been much. I mean, except for the Cook Islands, I haven't been to the South Pacific. Um, I mean, I say I've been to Russia. I've been to St. Petersburg. <laughs> you know, Russia has what? Eight time zones? Um, I haven't been to Russia, really. Um, so, yeah, there, there's huge, huge parts of the world that I haven't been to. Uh, yes? Uh, regarding discovery and uh, that emotional connection that you spoke about, uh, when we travel, we do try and live vicariously like local. But every once in a while, I feel like a voyeur as if I'm like an uninvited guest and I shouldn't be there. Do you ever get that sensation? And if so, what do you do with it? <laughs> do I ever feel like a voyeur? Um, not really. I mean, I, th I see what you mean. I think if you go, again, I, I, I think because I'm an urban traveler and I'm, I'm in cities where ever, there's so many people, I, I, I don't stand out. Nobody, it, definitely. I mean, if you go to a little village and then you're the only foreigner, yeah, then you, you could, I can see how you'd have that, that feeling. I did a uh, cruise down the Amazon once and they'd stop and take us to these villages. Yeah, there I did feel a little bit like a, like a voyeur, you know, it was kind of, let's show the Americans, the, the natives kind of thing. And yeah, that was a little uncomfortable. So I have, yeah, I have felt it sometimes. Yeah, Melanie. With a place or Satiated? Yes, like, okay, I'm done, I'm going to return. Yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are some yeah. places where, yeah, I've had a lot. Well, if not, then how do you keep the sense of wonder? How do you see, keep, keep the sense of wonder? Well, I, hopefully, I had it for the first week. Um, yeah, I, I, but there's a great, there's a great line in uh, Great Plains, a, a book by um, Ian Fraser. A New Yorker writer, and he said, "You don't really know a place until you've been bored in it." <laughs> so that's it. Yes. I was going to ask you a question, but um, were you doing an international book tour with the book, or? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, <laughs> no, my book tours are self-financed. Um, so so far, I've been to Sarasota and Tampa. <laughs> so. That book, books keep falling there. <laughs> Ricardo. Do you wish people would write about their experiences as they travel? Just a lot do. do. A lot do. Actually, I wish fewer people would write about their experiences. You know, the travel blog is, 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 is really big now. Everybody's a travel blogger. And um, I've tried to read some of them. And I'm sure there are some good ones. I just haven't found them. But... The ones I've read are just not that interesting. It's just kind of, and then I did this, and then I saw this. It's, it's not artful. And you know, when you're a writer and you're used to reading literature, uh, you're looking for a story, something that has a shape and a narrative and an interesting use of language. And I, I don't find that on the blogs. I think the blogs serve a different purpose. I think a lot of blogs are to give people information, you know. It's not to tell a story. And those who tell a story sometimes um, don't do it in the best way. So. But my mother always kept a journal when she traveled. The only time she ever wrote, except letters to me, she kept a journal when she traveled. And I do recommend people do that. Because even if you never go back and reread it, just the act of writing makes you remember. And, and I think that was very helpful to her. Yes? What do you like most now? Uh, Russia. Uh, no. I. I you know, again, I, there's so many places I'd like to go. Um, I think southern India, because I've been only to northern India, and uh, I want to get back and, and see those drivers again. Um, I hear they're better in the south than, than in the north. So, um, but also, you know, even kind of, I have some mundane places on my bucket list, and I, as a 
travel writer, I kind of embarrassed to admit this, but Parma, Italy is on my list. I've just heard fantastic things. I love Italian, I love European cities. And, and I've heard great things about Parma. You know, it's where you have Parma ham and Parmesan cheese. So the ham and cheese sandwiches must be great. <laughs> um, so there I am talking about food, just like the Travel Channel. Yeah, Chauncey. Where are the places that you'd like to go back to? Well, Poland I always want to go back to because it's kind of like my second homeland now. Um, Italy I'd like to go back to. Uh, I'd like to go back to Brazil. I'd like to see more of Brazil. Um, and, um, you know, most, actually most <laughs> places I've been I'd like to go back to. Um, but those, I think, stand out. Yes. If you went to Brazil, would you be going to the city like Rio de Janeiro? I did. My or first would you trip. Go, like to go out into the country and that sort of thing. Out in yeah. My well, my first trip was you know when I was at the newspaper and I and, and I was when I went to Brazil the first time. You know, I did the kind of standard first timers trip to a country. So I went to São Paulo, Salvador, Rio de Janeiro. Second time I went to Minas Gerais and, and uh, Belo Horizonte and, and Oro Preto. And so uh, next time I'd like to go, yeah, someplace different. Um, you know, not big, but not, you know, not, uh, not too small. Yes? Uh, which short trip is the longest, uh, how long and why? I'm sorry? Which short trip is the longest, how long and why? Which of my trips was the longest, yes. how long and why? Well, when I was at, I guess it was a month, uh, I went to Australia and New Zealand. And then it was a month because it's, you know, it takes, it's a long way to get there. And uh, I thought, yeah, I might as well spend a month. And uh, yeah, that was the longest. Thank you, Tom. All right, thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it. All right, quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time to call the number on your screen and we can send the book to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have the book for sale at the counter over there. Tom's going to be signing here at the table to the left of the podium and we have a reception set up in the back. So please give another hand to Tom Swick. Thanks very much. Thank you.